And it starts with a murder, bitch. So Velma's mom has amnesia. Norville's dad says that according to Velma's mom's chart, she has a mental wall built up to conveniently block out what's happened to her. And if her memories don't return within 72 hours, they'll be gone forever. If she remains happy, the memories will unlock. I could ask why this arbitrary time limit starts right this moment, but we all know by now that any bizarre decision this show does is because it doesn't know how to write plot and tries to cover up its jumps in logic with humor to lampshade the fact that this narrative has the structural integrity of a wet cardboard box. Velma's mom needing to stay happy for three whole days is a bit of a problem considering her husband has had a baby with the waitress who now lives with them. So we get a montage of Velma and her friends destroying her house to turn it back into the dump it was before Sophie moved in. Daphne asks Velma if she was serious about the girlfriend thing and when Velma says she was, Daphne says that the brains are holding a welcome home party and she and Velma should go as a couple in a dramatic reveal to upstage them. The upstaging is for no reason other than to be petty. Velma's mom comes home and has a memory trigger after wanting to take her glasses back. Velma is ecstatic that not only does she have her mom back, but the memory thing is working. She decides to finally open up the present her mom bought her all those years ago, revealing that they were nothing but a pair of Mary Jane shoes the real Velma wears. My expectations have been so subverted. You are such an intellectual and well-crafted show. You've completely thrown my previous knowledge about how story structure works for a loop. Truly, this is a mark of great skill and talent to deliberately disappoint your audience with an unsatisfying payoff when they were expecting to be entertained by your piece of media. I'm glad I waited this long and put so much expectation on it. Hey, Fatso! We got your favorite thing! Disappointment! Velma's mom becomes sad when she realizes Velma has grown up since she last saw her and she missed so much of it, which is not great for the whole memory thing. Velma says her mom doesn't have to worry since she hasn't really changed and is just as awful as she was before she went missing. Once again, confirming that Velma was a terrible person well before this mystery and she can't blame her terrible personality on trauma. Back at school, the popular girls reject Daphne from the clique because she tried to leave the brains for dead back in the mines and the brains have become head popular girls at the school thanks to pity points. Fair enough. She goes to stand with Fred, who has also been ostracized because he kept cheating on the brains the few hours he was locked away with them. Even the girl who pretends to be a cat won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> oh hey look, it's me in primary school. Daphne says the other popular girls don't get to say if she's popular or not, society's obsession with looks does. Once again, I point to the video previous, this one, or time code if this is the supercut, we are already discussed this, as the position of popular girl has more to do with power, manipulation and class politics than it actually does with being attractive. The sex appeal part is just one more tool to manipulate and dominate other people by making other girls feel inferior to you and having boys desperate to get a chance at banging you. It's not the dual end all to being popular. Velma interrupts Norville's fencing tournament to ask him to fake a report card for her so she can lie to her mom about how good her grades have been since she was gone. Later that evening, Norville hands it over to her, but they run into Sophie, who came back to the house to get the baby's blanket. The noise causes Velma's mom and dad to come see what's going on, and Velma in a blind panic lies and says the baby is actually hers and the father is Norville. All this causes Velma's mom to faint. When she comes to, she says she didn't actually faint because her 15-year-old daughter had a baby, but because she had another memory of when she was investigating the Joneses' manor. She found out in Edna Pardue's journals that there's a secret entrance to the bricked up lab through the well in the garden. Velma's mom also says that although she's not happy Velma had a baby, it's better than her husband cheating on her and she thinks Norville is a good dad. I'm a teddy bear. I'm named after Theodore Roosevelt, a wealthy demagogue who massacred indigenous people in the name of imperialism. Velma's mom still wants to know why Sophie is here and Velma lies again that Sophie is her boss at the malt shop and they paid her a lot of money to watch the baby while Velma's mom was in hospital. But now that she's home, Velma and Norville have to pretend to be Amanda's parents and actually look after her. The next day, Daphne shows up at Velma's house to let her know they can't go to the party and she runs into Velma's mom. Velma explains to Daphne that she's pretending to be in a relationship with Norville and they had a baby together, which gives Daphne an idea on how to be popular again and she runs off. 
You might have noticed that Gigi has conveniently been absent so far this entire episode. Or rather, she's not been absent. She's been regressed to being a background popular girl for Daphne's B-plot, so she doesn't get in the way of the Velma pretending to be a mom A-plot. Because having Gigi be upset about Norville's involvement would be inconvenient to this episode's narrative. Daphne goes to Fred's house and points out they were always more popular as a couple. So if they get back together in a big dramatic public reunion, it should be juicy enough at school to make them both popular again. Fred's mom agrees that that sounds like an excellent plan and laments that Fred doesn't have the same mind for petty manipulation that Daphne does. They arrive at school together and immediately get everybody talking about it. We get a montage of Velma being a horrible parent and constantly trying to bum the baby off onto everyone else around her, and Daphne and Fred staging various dramatic couple interactions at school for people to post to social media. Norville tells Velma to change Amanda's nappy while he forges a school headline about her, and Velma goes to find Norville's dad who is the school guidance counsellor. He isn't in his office, but while she's there, she finds the outfit the serial killer has been using in a box beside the desk. Hello, Velma. Has your mother regained her memory yet? Norville, what are you doing? Your mother's about to steal all of your green. Wait, what happened? We cut from Velma getting caught by Norville's dad with no way to escape, and the very next scene is Norville's family playing a board game together before a SWAT team bursts in because Velma called the cops. What just happened? Listen, I can't play the entire clip because of copyright, but here is the sequence of events. Velma comes into the office, she finds the welder's masks, Norville's dad walks in on her, cut to black, Norville's family is playing Monopoly, a SWAT team bursts in, and Velma demands to know why he has a welder's mask in his office. What the hell happened here? Seriously, how many writing passes did this episode go through? Because this feels like... You know what, no. This doesn't even feel like a first draft. This feels like a first draft where you write these two scenes but leave blank the part where they connect because you'll get back to writing that part later and then never come back to it. I have never seen a sequence of events this badly botched in an animated show before. The absolute lack of care and thought that these writers put into the supposed ego trip of a passion project is next level in how negligent it is. Did anyone on the writing team care about the show at all? Not even Mindy? The person who made this entire show just to stroke her already inflated ego? I'm trying to think of something else I can compare this to, but I am genuinely drawing a blank. This is the kind of shit that set Kathy Bates into a frenzy in misery. He didn't get out of the cock the duty car! The absolute level of contempt the show writers have for their own work is so beyond shocking to me. If you hate this show so much, then why are you making it? So Mindy can parade around and soak up all the automatic brownie points for making a cartoon with queer multiracial characters? Mindy's way of talking about the show and her constant insistence that it's very important that people know Velma is Indian, or in Mindy's words, South Asian, and that's why so many people hate it, 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 it keeps reminding me of someone like, I don't know, like Amberlynn Reed, I guess, who will make up like fake medical diagnoses, especially when someone else is going through something serious, just because they can't stand of not being the center of attention. Like, it's giving the same energy as that. I'm, I'm not sure if you understand what I mean, but th that's what it's reminding me of. How this, how people couldn't imagine a really smart, nerdy girl with terrible eyesight and who loved to solve mysteries could not be Indian. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, there are Indian nerds. Big guy, the case shouldn't be a surprise to people. Um, but people are like, no, no, no. I have ASMR. This show was not made because Mindy Kaling wanted to make an animated show about a character she likes. This show was made because Mindy wanted attention and accolades for being so brave to have made something featuring POC characters who are queer using a brand that has recognition value and she had no real interest in the condition of the final product. As long as it got her attention. Doesn't matter if the attention was good or bad, as long as it reinforced her idea that she is a progressive forward-thinking individual who is a martyr in the face of prejudice. And she gets to do so by exerting her power as a producer by making the main character a self-insert. 
something she has a pattern of doing in the shows she's been involved with. As an Indian loser with cystic acne, sweaty armpits and glasses. But with one LASIK procedure, an Accutane prescription and medical grade Botox injected into my armpits. Mindy Kaling, just because you are an Indian loser does not mean Indians are losers. It's here every day. At this point, you're genuinely doing more harm than good, like. One critical detail, which I haven't found room to mention yet, is the reason Scooby-Doo is not in this show. The official story given by show writer Charlie Grandy is that they couldn't figure out how to do an adult cartoon with a talking dog and make it funny. Grabby, no. I told you, no urinating on deck. It was an accident! You were marking your territory. You don't have a stroke for this job, Pally! <laughs> But this is not the actual reason. The real reason Scooby-Doo is not in this show is because Warner Brothers did not want the character who is massively popular with children having its brand sullied by associating him with an adult cartoon. Similar to how Disneyland no longer has the hyperspace hoopla event since the new Star Wars movies and TV show became a thing because they felt that the hyperspace hoopla would somehow damage the Star Wars brand. What's interesting to me is Warner Brothers had no problem with Scooby-Doo being in Supernatural, but most likely because there was a large emphasis on how much the original show and its characters held a sentimental place in so many people's hearts, and all the characters were presented as true to their original personalities as possible. Anyway, after being told no by Warner Brothers, Charlie Grandy's official reason for not having Scooby-Doo and Velma was we couldn't figure out a way to make him funny and that having a cartoon dog in the show automatically would make it for kids. Turning this into something being wrong with the character and not the writing. And a detail I find interesting is that after this rejection, Charlie Grandy refers to Scooby-Doo as the dog while explaining this in an interview. This might have been said as a joke and the tone didn't carry through into text, but it still stuck out to me. I don't want to say that it automatically means anything, it's just... I was reading the interview and seeing Charlie Grandy refer to Scooby-Doo as the dog while specifically speaking how they weren't allowed to use him in this show... I don't know, it might be nothing, but it stuck out. <laughs> it, it, it stuck out. Oh, but guess what? Scooby-Doo is in the show. In episode 7, when we pan down from Gigi's cabin to the underground mine, there's this. A silly tongue-in-cheek mean-spirited joke? Or Charlie Grandy purposefully going against Warner Brothers' hard no to be spiteful? You be the judge. The level of ego on display here is truly staggering. But really, is this level of narcissistic rage and misuse of power really that shocking by this point? Um, tell anyone and you're fired. Anyway, Norval's dad crafted a sword for Norval's birthday, so none of this meant anything anyway. Daphne and Fred have managed to regain their level of popularity and they get invited to the Brains' party that evening. However, Daphne is still planning to show up with Velma as her date in a dramatic reveal that they're a couple now. Fred's mom talks Daphne into not going through with it and keeping up the fake relationship with Fred until she's popular enough to do whatever she wants and get away with it like Chick-fil-A. This is just more stupid forced in topical throwaway lines, so even though I fully agree with the sentiment here, I still hate this writing. I have a terrifying prophecy that when the second season of this show comes out, a very large section of its writing is going to be dedicated to making offhanded jokes about how hated the first season was by racist, bigoted man babies. Like, I can already see the kind of humor season two is going to have to like snidey, snippy remarks about how the first season was received and spinning it into being criticism only made by, like, that character in that one Power Buff Girls episode. <laughs> that it's gonna happen, mark my words. That is going to be a big part of season two, I can see it now. Fred's mom tells Daphne if she's this good at making Fred popular again, she'd like her to intern for her at Jones' accessories, and Daphne enthusiastically agrees. Fred's dad overhears this and is clearly not pleased. Norville is understandably upset at Velma breaking the laws of continuity to accuse his dad of being the serial killer. Norville comments that if their positions were reversed, Velma would have left him for dead after his first hallucination. 
He also tells her she looks bad in orange, but she points out that he always says this when she says something he dislikes, like saying dwarves and elves are the same thing. An elf is a luminous spirit, and a dwarf is a hairy oaf. But most importantly, they are not friends. <sighs> Show writers. Once again, it helps if you actually understood any of the things you were trying to make jokes about. I thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. What about side by side with a friend? I... I could do that. Norville tells Velma to get lost, and Velma realizes that Amanda has rolled off into traffic and gives chase. Meanwhile, Fred and Daphne are making an impression at the Brains' really sparse and lame-looking party at the malt shop. And Gigi is still here, and not involved with the plot of her boyfriend pretending to have had Velma's baby because the writers didn't know what to do with her. The Brains accuse Daphne and Fred of faking their relationship and tells them to kiss to prove it. Daphne and Fred have no problem with this, but Velma walks in just in time to see this, having chased Amanda, who's rolled here to find her mom. Velma announces this just as her own mom walks in. Since the 72 hours are up anyway and Velma's mom didn't recover her memories, they come clean to her about Sophie and her husband having an affair. However, Velma's mom suddenly finds she can remember who the serial killer is now that she's so relieved to no longer have to be part of a loveless and unfulfilling marriage, despite earlier saying that her daughter's teen pregnancy was better than being cheated on. And, just as she tries to say the name, we cut to credits. Halfway through the credits, we cut back to Velma's mom confessing that she herself is the serial killer. Sure, why not? One more episode. Let's get through this. Velma's mom is getting arrested for admitting to... Well, I guess it's not really murder, is it? In fact, should we even be calling the main antagonist a serial killer considering they haven't technically killed anyone? Anyway, Velma is upset because it doesn't make any sense to her why her mom would try and continue doing Dr. Pardew's work, although she was perfectly happy throwing Norval's dad under the bus, and I can't see why he makes any more sense than Velma's mom. Anyhow, now she's pissy because nobody else seems to care that it makes no sense for her mom to be the serial killer. She gave a confession, Velma. What are the cops supposed to do? Ignore it? Actually, that's a rabbit hole for another time. Has there ever been a confession to a murder that the police have thrown out? I'm pretty sure there's been one where a real serial killer confessed their crimes over the phone and the police kind of wrote it off as a prank call. Like, I can't remember the name or the details, but I am convinced that has happened. It's sticking in the back of my brain. Anyway, sidetracking, back to this awful show. The van gets auctioned off under the illustrious title of belonging to one of America's few female serial killers, which... There's a lot wrong with that sentence, but I don't feel like going on a true crime side quest so late into this review. I'm already tempted to do so, so let's just move on. Norville decides to be awful and not so much make fun of Velma for her mom being a serial killer, but spitefully shoving a microphone into her face, asking her to comment on her mom being a serial killer for the school paper. Velma tries to apologize for accusing his dad, but Norville isn't interested in her apology. Daphne jumps in to defend Velma, until Velma brings up the fact that Daphne kissed Fred, so Daphne beats the shit out of her. You know, it's, it's, it's very engaging and not at all boring watching a bunch of hateful and unfunny characters self-destruct on screen when I feel equal disdain for all of them, and as such, don't care if they put each other in hospital, really. <sighs> Velma is mouthing off at Daphne's moms about doing their job to clear her obviously innocent mom. And they show her a video of Velma's mom confessing a second time during a police interview by also providing a motive. The motive being, she wanted to put the brain of a popular girl into the head of Velma. Velma says this makes even less sense because her delusion about how the world should always align with her own wants and needs is so strong. Also, Daphne's mom say how Velma's mom is going to go on death row for this, despite her not actually killing anyone and, worse, be verbally hounded by true crime podcasters. I don't know anything about this because the only true crime podcast I listen to is Last Podcast on the Left, and I can promise you they have very little interest listening to serial killers other than to further dunk on them for being pathetic losers with mommy issues. 
I don't know if other true crime podcasters hound serial killers for interviews or whatever, so I can't say if this joke is just another example of the writers of the show not knowing what they're talking about or not. So we'll just move on. Velma wants to spend five minutes with her mom to try and figure out why her mom would confess, but the sheriff isn't interested in Velma messing up his case. Daphne's moms tell Velma the only way she'll manage to speak to her mom is if she gets arrested herself, and because the sheriff is really against Velma and her mom speaking, the only thing he'd arrest Velma for is murder. Why does this show insist on creating nonsensical out of left field rules to its episodes just so it can have a plot? It keeps doing this over and over and it never makes sense. Oh, we found Velma's mom, but suddenly there's a 72 hour deadline to get her memories back, but only in this one episode. We have a curfew now, but only for this one episode. We're having the hot girls take ugly classes, but only for this one episode. Like, who gives a crap? It's clear you're just making up narrative hooks as you go. The plot to your episodes and hell, your entire show is so uninteresting and badly constructive, you had to artificially create extra rules just so that there can be some semblance of stakes that you're just going to completely throw out the window by the end of the episode anyway. Hi, welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway, the show where everything's made up and the points don't matter. We cut to Daphne, who is getting her introduction to working for Jones's accessories. Fred's mom gives her the spiel that although she married into the Joneses, she's the one who helped turn it from a singular store into a massive company. She reveals that her true motive to hiring Daphne is because she could never get Fred to listen to her regarding one day taking over. However, Fred willingly listened to Daphne about becoming popular again. So Fred's mom wants to ask Daphne to get Fred to become more involved with the company and prepare him for eventually running it. Daphne says if she has to spend more time with Fred, she has to sort out some personal stuff with Velma first. And Fred's mom rightfully points out that nobody cares about her bullshit relationship drama. Back with Velma, she's at Fred's place because she needs his help so she can talk to her mom. Norville phones her and inexplicably, she blows him off. Isn't Norville her go-to lackey? Hasn't she purposefully told Fred to leave her alone because he's bad at being her minion and she was willing to break up Norville and Gigi just so he could be her minion again? And now he's calling her and she's ignoring him because she wants Fred's help? You see what I mean about the show setting up rules and then just completely throwing them out the window? Anyway, Velma hears screaming and finds Fred having a tantrum in the garage. He's upset because his mom doesn't think he's fit to run the business, which, again, makes no sense because so far he has continually shown open hostility to taking part in anything to do with the business. The show is literally crumbling in on itself in the final episode. It's the narrative equivalent of that house that Homer Simpson built. Fred bought the van and I genuinely can't decipher his reasoning for it and I failed to hurt myself giving it any more thought than I need to so here's what he says and you guys can figure it out for yourselves. Because all cool fashion advertising for teens is just trashy, pedo-tinged sex stuff. So maybe if I drive this thing around, I can make gentlemen's accessories cool and prove to my mom I'm not a joke. Also, Fred says he's sensitive about always being wrong about everything, but he has consistently proven himself to be a better detective than Velma. In fact, I have yet to see one instance where Fred has actually been wrong about something that mattered. Anyway, remember how this episode said Velma can only get arrested for something like murder? Yeah, forget that immediately because Velma has asked Fred to tell the police she's bothering him which gets her arrested instantly because something, something ethnicity. I was unaware that the American police cared about Indian women more than anyone else, but sure, whatever. Also, Daphne's moms are really happy about Velma doing this for some reason. Velma is given some time to talk to her mom because apparently Daphne's moms have spontaneously decided to be on Velma's side for absolutely no reason other than the writers needed them to be to have any of this work. Velma tries to assert that her mom didn't really mean what she said about putting someone else's brain into her head, but her mom repeats verbatim what she said during the police interrogation in a way that makes it clear this is some kind of brainwashing. It takes Velma a second to realize this, but her mom finally manages to let her know that every time she tries to say what really happened, she just repeats the motive. 
Velma's mom says she thinks she was hypnotized. And Velma posits that that kind of plot twist is only something you see in 70s cartoons and that the solution is snapping your fingers. Yeah, sure, I'll give her that one since I think I kind of know what they're going for here. But the way this plot point of undoing the hypnosis is snapping is never brought up again. And in fact, makes this entire plot not work, but we'll get there when we get there. Daphne asks Norval if he's seen Velma at school. Sorry, Daph, but I'm just too tired of Velma's bullshit to care where she is. Oh, and I guess Gigi is just not a character anymore. Did she and Norval break up off screen too? Daphne goes to her locker and finds a note in a geode from her birth mom, who has given her the pocket watch she found in the mines. Turns out she wasn't killed by the serial killer, she just got away immediately. The watch is at first presented as an earnest apology for abandoning Daphne, which would be a hollow gesture anyway, if at least a poignant one, but the show is allergic to human emotions, so undercuts this by saying she's giving the watch to Daphne as an apology for stealing $10 out of her locker. Back with Velma, the sheriff bursts in and drags Velma's mom away so she can go to death row. Velma yells at him that her mom was hypnotized and the serial killer is still loose just as Daphne arrives her mom's having let her in. She shows Velma the pocket watch. Velma comments she's seen it before and suddenly has a panic attack and they play that same clip of Mindy Kaling being unable to sell a scream. Did they have Mindy just scream once and it didn't really come out that well because she doesn't know how to do it and then they just reused it every single time they needed it because at this point it sounds like it's the exact same sound clip every single time. Velma finds herself in her own memories at her mom's van the night she went to go looking for her. There, she finds her younger self being hypnotized by the same serial killer, meaning her hallucinatory episodes brought on by feelings of guilt were all due to being hypnotized and not actually real. This is one of the very few plot twists I am not actually that annoyed about. It's a weak twist, but it's serviceable enough so I'm fine with it. Except for the fact that Velma being hypnotized means she should have broken out of her hallucinations the second somebody snapped their fingers, as it is well established that the only reason the brain swapping exists is because the hypnosis is so easily undone. I guess it's very lucky then that nobody has ever snapped their fingers near Velma in the however many years, two, three, whatever, that her mom has been missing. Otherwise, none of this show makes sense. Hey girlies! Mindy fails to scream again and Velma wakes up. She lets Daphne know the watch belonged to the serial killer and Daphne says it has an inscription on it. The inscription is for the army guy who hired Dr. Pardue to do the brain swapping in the first place. Remember I said the stupid hypnosis thing was actually plot important so I had to mention it? Yeah, don't worry, it's fine if you don't. I fully understand not committing any of this show to memory. Velma says this is a problem because the army guy is dead. I don't know how she knows this. Daphne does some split second changes here where she apologizes for kissing Fred, asks for another chance, promises nothing will come between them, gets a phone call she says she has to take, hears Fred's been arrested for weird sex van things, and then leaves off to spraying Velma with some kind of Jones's accessories as perfume and telling her to let her know if she gets a rash. She leaves in the limo Fred sent and Fred's dad is skulking around. I already used the everybody got that clip. Back at school, the hot girls and the brains are having sexy underage shower time again and talking about summer of the TV trope before Velma bursts in. Why is she no longer in jail for bothering Fred? Because the writers wrote themselves into a corner so just decided to throw away that detail because it's no longer important. And before you say anything, my mom didn't kill you and put you in those jars. Well, nobody killed them considering they're, you know, alive. The brains don't recognize the watch and Velma is upset that she doesn't have anything else to prove her mom's innocence. Gigi tells her this is what she deserves for taking Norval for granted every day for years. Gigi then lets know Norval is changing schools because he doesn't want to be around Velma anymore and I do not fucking blame him. Get out of the show while you can, Norval. You're a terrible person, but this can only be a good thing for you. Oh my god, I'm home! <laughs> Velma says Norville would have told her if he was transferring. Gigi says he did, and she's been ignoring him. And Velma goes... I don't... 
I don't have time for this. I have to save my mom. That's right, Velma. Run. Run away from the consequences of your actions. Run away from your responsibilities. You'll be able to escape yourself someday, I'm sure. Velma is inspecting her conspiracy wall and grumbles about Norval not being around when she needs him. She groans and decides to listen to his voice messages. She suddenly realizes she has not listened to a single one of these for the past two years and ends up spending the entire day listening to them and suddenly feels bad now that her number one narc supply is no longer around. The very first voice message he sends her complimented her new glasses and she takes them off and realizes that the frames were made by Jones's accessories. She also realizes the flower logo which has never been shown in any of the episodes before this at all is also on the pocket watch and the same pocket watch is in a photo of Fred's dad. Velma gets her dad to drive her to Fred's house and not her mom, who is currently sitting on death row because apparently Daphne and Fred are in trouble. So you believing me counteracted that. Same with Norville saying he liked me. I thought it was because he made me laugh. But it was because he made me feel cared for the way a cool ass boss bitch like myself deserves to be. I'm so glad all these fictional characters are coming together to praise Mindy's self insert for being cool and awesome. As an audience member, this is exactly the kind of vanity project I love watching when I want to enjoy Scooby-Doo. Velma sneaks into the lab through the well entrance, but decides to leave Norval a manipulative voice message about him being her best friend in case she dies, and accidentally ends the message by saying, love you, before falling into the water at the bottom of the well, which causes her phone to die. Convenient. Inside the lab, Velma finds Daphne and Fred strapped down to operating tables along with the serial killer. The killer hears her and leaves and Velma snuck into the room without him seeing her somehow and wakes up Daphne. The killer attacks her but she sprays them with some of the perfume Daphne had which causes the bats in the crystal cave to attack them. I feel like I'm playing Mad Libs trying to explain this. The group ties up the serial killer and Velma does the Scooby-Doo thing of how she figured out who the person in the mask is. Velma says that the first two bodies were meant to frame her, but the third body was discovered by someone else and was to exonerate Fred. I would like to remind everyone that Lola's body was never discovered on screen at any point and was just randomly announced and we didn't even know who had actually been killed until her name showed up on a PowerPoint slide at the press conference. This show is trying to gaslight us into thinking not providing any information about a murder in a serial killer case is in fact a clue instead of just piss poor writing. Anyway, the serial killer is Fred's mom, who is actually the army guy's daughter. So when Velma was being annoying as hell about why the boys in high school don't have to take don't murder girl classes and how the watch belongs to a serial killer so it's definitely covered in spunk and the various other sexist comments, it was all for naught because the serial killer in this case was a woman. So I'm glad all those extremely annoying talking points we were forced to sit through were there for no reason other than to instigate the audience. Turns out Fred's mom wanted to replace his brain with that of someone actually competent to run the company one day. She also reveals that the reason the brain swap plan of the 70s didn't work was not because Dr. Pardue went crazy. The experiment was actually a success, but the army guy tried to take credit for it causing Dr. Pardue to throw a tantrum, undo the brain swap and hide all her work so it couldn't be recreated, so the army guy threw her in the asylum. Fred's mom then married into money and after realizing Fred is an idiot, she brought the mansion where the lab is located so she could recreate the experiments that Dr. Pardue purposefully made unrecreatable to put a smart person's brain into Fred. She kidnapped Velma's mom who had found the journals which were just in the historical society where anyone could check them out and then hypnotized her into rebuilding the lab for some reason. Also Fred's mom wanted to use a popular girl's brain because something something woman as a powerful man running a big company. I'm sure they tried to make this mean something or make a statement about something but it really doesn't. Because I wanted someone like me. An ambitious, status-conscious young woman who could appreciate what she might achieve as the male president of a global corporation. Fred's mom then announces that Velma's brain is the perfect candidate and her husband, who has also been hypnotized, comes out of the shadows brandishing a gun. Turns out he's been skulking around because he'd figured out what Fred's mom has been up to. 
So even Fred's dad is a better detective than Velma is. Anyway, there's more talk here about how Fred's mom realized that popular white girls wouldn't appreciate the advantages of being a rich white man, but Velma would because she's not white and blah 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 blah. You may have noticed that unlike previous parts, I have been more and more mentioning Mindy Kaling, whereas I generally don't talk about show creators that much in relation to the product they make unless I absolutely have to. When talking about High Guardian Spice, I would mention Ray Rodriguez, especially since that show also had a blatant self-insert. Actually, it had two, but by the time the show was being created, it was very clear which of the two characters Ray was using as an avatar for himself more than the other. And as such, Ray's self-insert into High Guardian Spice was more of a secondary character. In Velma, it's not just that Velma is a blatant self-insert for Mindy herself, and being the worst kind of self-insert, where the self-insert is a worse and worse person because none of the writers can speak up against the character's actions because the character is a self-insert of the show's executive producer. It's that not only is Velma a vanity project self-insert, but she also gets to be Mindy's personal soapbox. Not so much of her belief on politics, gender, race or whatever, but a soapbox for Mindy to announce that she, Mindy, is the bestest person ever and everyone else in the entire world have treated her unfairly and how everyone in the world just refused to recognize how awesome she is. And it couldn't be for something like her awful personality. No, no, it had to be something she couldn't control, like her race or her gender or financial status or weight or literally anything that she has no control over because if it was something like her actions or personality she would actually have to take responsibility and change how she treats people i know nothing about mindy kaling as a person all i know is what she said in interviews about how she sexually harassed her male co-star told her crew that if anybody told anyone she'd fire them that everybody hated her version of Velma because of her race and the fact that Velma is a blatant self-insert, as well as the stance that the fictional character Velma constantly takes on how the narrative frames her. I am not someone who thinks that a work of fiction is always about what the author condones or approves of. That's some book-burning mentality. The kind that says that if you write about upsetting topics of any kind, you're secretly supporting them or normalizing them because you're a degenerate and I use that term in its original meaning. And as such, all offending material needs to be burned lest it corrupt our society. In the traditional horror movie, we often saw things from the victim's point of view, but that's no longer. Now we look through the killer's eyes. It's almost as if the audience is being asked to identify with the attackers in these movies and that really bothers me. The type of people who think along these lines are the kind who think every single story is some kind of morality tale or meant to teach you a very important lesson and who think it's taboo to write about any topic that they find uncomfortable or upsetting. Up until now, everything around here has always been, well, pleasant. Recently. Certain things have become unpleasant. Which is simply not true. Fritz Lang did not make the movie M because he thought murdering children was cool. Joseph Conrad didn't write Heart of Darkness because he thought colonialism was a good idea. Pretty sure he thought the opposite was true, actually. George R. Martin didn't write Game of Thrones because he thought incest was okay. But when the show Mindy Kaling made as the executive producer with the main character voiced by Mindy Kaling, who Mindy Kaling changed from white to her own race, who then spends a large part of the show with the narrative reinforcing people discriminating against her largely because of that race that Mindy Kaling is and her weight, which Mindy Kaling has also struggled with, all the while never calling out her terrible behavior except when it's a joke or for Mindy Kaling's character to justify her actions and eventually be exonerated by the narrative, how else am I supposed to see this but as a reflection of Mindy Kaling as a person? I don't know anything about Mindy Kaling, but after watching this show, I do not want to and I hope never to cross paths with her. 
Sometimes an author writes about terrible people to explore a dark narrative. And sometimes an author writes about terrible people because they happen to be a terrible person and they lack any self-awareness. <sighs> so Velma agrees to go through with the plan to have her brain put into Fred's body. I am so sick of rich guys like you, not only not realizing how much is handed to them, but still thinking they're the victims when they mess everything up because of their lazy entitlement and fragile egos. So this causes Fred to rage, break free of the table and beat up his dad. Fred's mom runs away. I only said those things to rile you up. I mean, yes, I feel that way, but... No, I'm glad you said it, Velma. Only friends tell each other the truth, and I'm proud to call you a friend, no matter how annoying I find your voice. Wow, I'm already loving our new truth dynamic. Now get out of here, I'll stop my mom. Wasn't the entire point of the show about how Velma is going to show us how she was the one behind Mysteries Inc, and it totally wasn't Fred at all, and how Fred is just some cringe fail lord, while she is the real brains of the operation? Because, once again, Fred is proving to be the base character in the show minus Gigi, although she stopped being a character now that the show writers aren't interested in her anymore. Fred catches up with his mom, while Daphne and Velma escape back to the well. They are cornered by Fred's mom, who managed to get the gun away from Fred by telling him she's possessed by the ghost of Dr. Pardue, and that just made sense to him, so he dropped the gun in shock. See, he didn't even hand over the gun. Writers, you're doing a terrible job of making us dislike Fred more than we dislike, well, anyone else in this show. Regardless, Fred's mom now has a gun and is about to kill them, so Daphne confesses her love for Velma, they kiss with some more extremely awkward animation, and Velma confesses her love back but accidentally calls Daphne Norval. Anyway, Norval then shows up because he actually bothered to listen to Velma's voice message. Fred's mom shoots at him, but he parries the bullet with his sword. It hits a stalactite. Fred's mom calls them meddling kids and then gets turned into chunky salsa when the giant rock falls on her. Like, best day ever! I solved the case! Happy dance! So they all get awards. Fred is pissed at Norval for, you know, killing his mom and stuff, and Daphne is pissed that Velma called her Norval in her love confession. Velma then has a movie night with her mom as they watch a dark, edgy horror origin story movie about Boo Boo from Yogi Bear, which Velma praises as being a good idea, which tells me a lot about these writers' taste. And it turns out Velma locked her dad, Sophie, and the baby out of the house, proving that her reunion with her mom did not in fact make her a better person in any real way. We then have a wrap up with the other characters, like Norval being upset he murdered someone, Daphne finding a meaningless note, which I'm sure is a hook for the second season, which I'm going to bet the writers didn't know what they were actually going to do for the second season when they wrote this part. Fred is sad his mom is dead and is shown to actually have started Mysteries Inc. without Velma. And Velma delivers all her evidence to this… she calls it a case but I'm going to call it a fiasco. Oh, and then the sheriff, I was informed, was supposed to be a nod to longtime Scooby-Doo guest star Don Knotts, gets murdered in the police department basement because this show couldn't end without taking one last shit on the original Scooby-Doo franchise. And that's it. That is the entire show. You know, I had a lengthy conclusion for High Guardian Spies that was so long I had to originally release it as its own separate video, just because I had so much more to say about its characters and world building. I have none of that here. The characters are all so hateful with zero redeeming qualities apart from Fred and Gigi that there is nothing more I want to say about them because it would mean spending more time with them. And I don't want to do that. I had an entire farewell montage for High Guardian Spice, a show I did not like. Nothing about Velma makes me want to prolong my exposure to it. The humor is badly written and unfunny. The plot is barely held together and most episodes are constructed with no purpose other than to artificially drive the characters towards the plot points the writers want, which is the opposite of how you should write. 
let your characters dictate the direction of your story, even if that goes against your initial plan. Hell, did you guys know that Rosa Versailles was originally meant to have Marie Antoinette as the main character? Something you can still kind of see in the earliest chapters of the manga, but Lady Oscar was just so… well, look at her, that Ryoko Ekida literally changed who her main character was. Throwing away your own story's rules, setups, and the pre-established personality traits of your own characters when you feel like it or when they become inconvenient is purely bad writing. In the first part, I mentioned how previous adult comedy shows have proven that you can have a very successful and beloved show when all of your main characters are assholes. I've been thinking about this, having main characters be terrible people I mean, and I think I more or less understand what the big difference is between Velma and all the other successful shows with terrible people as their main cast. And this is something that can be applied beyond adult comedy television into any genre of story. In the shows that are beloved that have terrible people as their main characters, the overarching narrative, that weird innocuous thing which conducts the tone and direction of the story, never once denies that these characters are terrible. That doesn't mean it punishes wrongdoing and smites down the wicked like we're still living under the Hayes Code, but the narrative presents these characters as awful and never shies away from the fact that they're awful. And that's the kicker. That's the magic X-Factor ingredient that makes the terrible main character work in shows like Seinfeld and Faulty Towers and Always Sunny. The narrative says, this is a show about terrible people. And because the narrative never tries to bullshit us that these terrible people are anything but terrible for the things they do, we as the audience do not get frustrated or enraged or feel like we're being lied to or gaslit. I mentioned the movie M before, which is an incredible film and I genuinely urge you to watch it if you can stomach the dark subject matter of a child murderer. Also yes, I am about to make a comparison between the film classic M and Mindy Kaling's Velma. The movie M is an incredible study not of a singular person's evil actions, but the collective reactions and inactions of everyone in the town where the serial killer is hunting. We see the reactions from the police, from the organized crime syndicates, and from the common people. We see how the terrible actions of a child murderer brings out to the terrible realities of everyone in town. The police start harassing people and the criminal underground not because they were so enraged by the murders, but because their inability to capture the murderer is making them look incompetent, so they want to present themselves as actually doing something. The criminal underground get involved in identifying the murderer not because they care about the children of the town, but because it is starting to affect their business. The common people get at each other's throats, trying to find blame for how this could happen, desperate to have someone they can direct their anger at, causing arguments and right out fights to break out, as well as accusations and suspicion to go wild. At the end, the child murderer monologues about his uncontrollable compulsion and demands to know from the people of the town how they can condemn him for actions he has no control over, as if they themselves are pure and just. Ich will davon, von mir selber davon laufen, aber ich kann nicht, kann mir nicht entkommen, muss, muss den Weg gehen, den es mich jagt, muss rennen, rennen. The movie ends with the somber note from the mothers, the only time in the whole movie you ever actually hear from the victims, that the ones at fault are them, us, everyone for not protecting children better. It's a very grim movie with no real heroic characters in it, but nowhere in the film at any point do you ever feel like the narrative is praising the actions of the police or the crime families or the public or even the murderer himself. Even when we hear the murderer break down sobbing as he tries to explain himself, we cannot deny he is telling the truth, but we also do not see him as vindicated or worth forgiving. His monologue is an explanation, not an excuse. The narrative presents a story about terrible people, but never tells you to admire them. 
pity them, sure, sympathize with them even, but admire them or even condone them? No. And M is still regarded as one of the greatest films ever made to this day, despite one being made in 1931, two being a foreign language film and three having been made shortly after the invent of sound, which does result in one or two awkward moments in the film as far as sound design goes. Velma, on the other hand, is a show where almost every character is a terrible person, and even the ones who are not outright terrible, they still do terrible things which in any other show would be worth commenting on, but here is so drowned out simply by how much worse everyone else is. But the narrative is insistent that we are supposed to find these characters endearing. The narrative insists that Velma is a brilliant but misunderstood, not like other girls character, whose horrible actions just make her more human and relatable. Likewise, it wants to present Daphne as, I don't know, hot but with an interesting and complex backstory, I guess. It wants Fred to be a straw man for rich white dudes. It wants Norville to be a reliable but easily coerced friend who is just hopelessly in love, and it wants to paint these characters as this ragtag little group of quirky teenagers who are just more real for having flaws, and who are also sexy and we get to see make out with each other. It tries to tell us the horrible things they do is just funny hijinks. This is an adult comedy show, don't take it so seriously. It tries to gaslight the audience by showing us Velma being a terrible person and then going, Wow, isn't she just the greatest? It really sucks the adults in this show forced her into behaving that way. It's sad that her insecurity over her mom made her use and abuse her friends and loved ones. It's so awful society doesn't recognize how smart she is because she's unattractive, fat and not white. All the while, showing us characters like Velma both do and say incredibly horrible, hateful shit to the people they're supposed to be friends with. Most of the time without any justification, and never showing them do anything positive for each other that could balance everything else out. And as I said, the biggest problem is almost nothing in this show is funny. The constant meta-aware references, topical humor, and lip service to US social issues are so constant, unrelenting, and always delivered in the exact same way, in all scenes, all the time, that even if you did find them funny at first, you get so numb to them after a while that you kind of just go on autopilot. When you hear a character start saying a sentence in a certain way, you already know there is going to be some or other comment shoved in at the end to undercut the dialogue. So your brain just kind of glazes over as you wait for the character to get back to the plot. It causes the dialogue and conversations to feel like someone learning to drive a car and they make the car do this. I'm not sure why this happens, but you get what I mean. Velma is a bad show. And although the frustrating usage of US social and political issues and its handling of race is part of why it's bad, it's not bad because it has these elements in it. It's bad because it's badly written, and that's all there is to it. The characters are badly written, the plot is badly written, the jokes are badly written, and as a result, unfunny. The social commentary is badly written and implemented. Everything that is wrong with this show is down to bad writing. The reason people dislike this show, Mindy, is because it is badly written. So far, I have put in little comparisons and discussions of the characters and how they compare to their original versions, but I haven't said anything about Norville. And that's because Norville literally does not have even the slightest bit of resemblance to Shaggy in his personality or actions. The closest they came to invoking Shaggy at all was having Norville be a streamer who talks about weird snack food, which was a single throwaway gag in one episode which they never mentioned again. The only other time anything resembling Shaggy is brought up is so Norville can blatantly state he hates weed, as some sort of joke about him being nothing like the original Shaggy, since Shaggy being a stoner has been a joke for such a long time it's borderline canon at this stage. But Norville doesn't show anything I can even point at as a botched attempt to represent Shaggy. They didn't even try. 
They took an OC, which has no resemblance to Shaggy at all, didn't even bother to actually name him Shaggy, made a passing reference to weed and food, and then left it at that as far as their fun new interpretation goes. Guys, here's my fun new interpretation of Usage Itsukino from Sailor Moon. Her name is Mindy. She's a stereotypical horse girl who hopes to become an author someday. Also, she hates anime. Shaggy and by extension Scooby are the two favorite characters from the Scooby-Doo franchise because more than any other character, Shaggy and Scooby are the heart of the team. Something I think they might actually have said in a movie or something, but it remains true. You can ask, how do you make a Scooby-Doo show without Scooby-Doo, but honestly, how do you make a Scooby-Doo show without Shaggy? And how do you have Shaggy without Scooby? And the answer is, as Velma has clearly shown us, you don't. Shaggy and Scooby, unlike any one of the other characters, have endured as they are, because they are the lovable, endearing core of the entire thing. Shaggy and Scooby are cowards, they like food, they're kind of dumb and kind of clumsy, they're kind of a couple of fuck-ups, and they are best friends who care about each other. We'll never be anything but our old goofy selves. I wish once, just once, I could do the right thing on purpose. I said at the start of part one that I have no personal attachment to Scooby-Doo as a franchise more than anyone else would. But there is a very large audience who are deeply attached to these characters. And it's not some group of boomers who are gripped with nostalgia and hate everything new. Scooby-Doo has managed to be the childhood of every generation that has grown up after 1969, and that remains true to this very day. Scooby-Doo, to this day, is a personal favorite of many children who have no idea how old the cartoon they love even is. These characters matter to people, and they should matter to people. But these characters don't matter to Mindy. Um, and I just, first of all, I didn't know that she elicited such strong reactions. Well, there's your problem, Mindy. You don't even know your audience. And based on what we've got in the show, you still don't. Velma has been announced as HBO Max's most watched series. And this is probably true. But I still cast massive doubt on this. Velma released after HBO Max absolutely slaughtered its animation section after its merger with Discovery. The list of animated shows that were not only cancelled but outright removed and literally scrubbed from the platform is staggering, and one of the big reasons why the Writers Guild strike is happening at the moment. So my question is, if you've completely gutted almost your entire catalogue and then released a brand new show in a legacy franchise which you've already instigated your audience over, how big of a win is most watched cartoon on HBO Max really? There is something to be said for hate watching, but I would think Morbius, the all-female Ghostbusters and the live-action Pinocchio has taught us that hate watching can only carry you so far. Hell, not even cats managed to ride hate watching to success and that movie was everywhere when it came out. So although I do understand the damage of a large enough group of people hate watching can have, I don't think that was the case here. I think because this carried the name of Scooby-Doo that people were trying to give it enough of a chance to at least watch it. And the reason it scored so low everywhere is because the large group of people who were willing to watch it did not like it. It's not some vast conspiracy of bigotry or sexism. This show was watched by a lot of people and they didn't like it. Will season two be a success? Maybe. It still carries the name of Scooby-Doo, so it's possible, but I don't know if it'll get the same amount of attention. Everyone knows it's terrible now. Is anyone going to be shocked when season two is terrible too? Would you care if it's not terrible? When it comes out, are you going to watch it or are you just going to wait for a YouTube review to tell you how it compares to the first season? And will those YouTube reviewers say much more than, yep, it's still bad. Maybe it'll do well, maybe it won't. 
I'm not here to have some call to arms telling you not to hate watch something. I, I don't think it's that deep. It's an unfunny show that was badly written and in time will become irrelevant. That's all. I'm done. What? I'm done finding you. I'm bored. You're boring me. Special thanks to top patrons Trey Windenol, Gunther38, Fulon Cool, and me and my guester. And thank you to everyone who supports the show, both on Patreon as well as YouTube memberships. We really revere the characters in the original, and we think, you know, they we really used a lot of their most like the pillars of their personalities and just tried to explore that in a super like respectful and affectionate way. Um, yeah, 